From a woman's perspective, a woman is now aware that she is a dynamic, wonderful, integrated being and everything is in balance. Being in balance in your life, having the best relationship possible and developing strong self-esteem, prevention is the key. Prevent it, you will not look like your mother did or feel like your grandmother did when you're at the same age. No more thinking that your answer to your inner beauty comes from outside. I'm Gary Nall. What I'd like to do is have all the men right now please leave the room. This program is for women only. Most women I have met in my life are like wonderful, wonderful oasis of beauty and passion and enormous amount of feeling. And yet, because of their conditioning, they're not in the oasis. If you're a woman and you're facing going in from, let's say, the age of 40 to 60, where you're going to be facing menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause, you're going to learn how you can change everything about menopause. There's no reason you should suffer from cramps or fatigue or mood swings. There's natural treatments for all this. For all you women who have struggled so hard to try to control your weight and you haven't cheated and you haven't overindulged and you've been blamed that somehow you're lazy or irresponsible or emotionally incapable of maintaining your physical well-being, well, I'm going to show you that it's not your fault that you're fat. We're going to show you that you have tried hard, but no one explained to you something about your biochemistry. No more fatigue. No more lack of libido. No more thinking that your answer to your inner beauty comes from outside. Why me? Why a man discussing an issue on health? Well, for one reason, for the past 40 years of my life, I've watched how women have been treated by the mass media, by the medical community, and I've always offered a forum for the leading advocates of what women can do to take back the power to make important choices in their life. Everything evolves from something in the past that we almost never understand. If you went back into the Middle Ages, you'd find that women were really not allowed to go to school. They couldn't have higher educations in most areas of the world. They were prevented from being in guilds and crafts and learning things. As a result, what was considered sacred, which was knowledge, was given to men only. So women did what they could. They raised their families, and some women learned about midwifery. They learned about herbs. In fact, almost every village, the person who did much of the healing locally was the local herb woman. And they mastered this craft, and they helped a lot of people. So it's not difficult then to understand over the centuries how those few women who tried to lead and educate were always persecuted. They were always martyred. And it's not even until the late 1800s that we started to see any school allow women, even in for any position, and it was not until the beginning of the century that women actually became physicians. And then it was rough form. They said, hey, if I'm a woman and I'm a physician, I'm going to honor healing. And healing has to be whole body, mind, spirit, environment, emotions. One of the things that I suggest that you pay attention to is the relationship that you create with your attending physician. One of the things I love the most about my job is that I get to talk to each woman who comes to my practice about really tailoring this process to her. And that's what every woman deserves. This whole idea of one size fits all, that all women who have depression should be given an antidepressant, or if you can't sleep, why don't you take a sleeping pill, that doesn't work. Women really are deserving of individualized attention. All of us are so unique. This is really where we're heading with medicine. I don't know if you've noticed, but I think the healthcare system is completely broken and we need to rebuild it. And a key part of that is understanding each person's genetics and also their lifestyle, how their lifestyle changes the way that their genes are expressed. That's called epigenetics. So it's so important to have that conversation. You know, it's that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a woman in my office where 
we're just leaning in and we're talking about the truths in her life, how much stress she has, what can we change, what kind of supplements does she take, what does she eat, how much does she move. Those are the things that really need to inform us as we individualize treatment. And why not look at to see if you can participate in your own healing process. Disease only exists where there is a lack of balance. When you have a lack of balance, you have conflict. Conflict then manifests as symptoms. By the time you see the first symptom, it might be 20 years of conflict. When the doctor says, hey, you're lucky. We caught the breast cancer early. You say from the woman's perspective, no doctor, you caught it late. What I don't like is medicine that doesn't honor the need to change when it's shown that it should. I support surgery when it's necessary, emergency medicine. Look, if you've got a heart attack or needed something that is critical care, we've got the best medicine in the world here. It's the chronic care that we miss out on. We all have to be honest about what causes disease, including our environment when it's polluted, our diet when it's misguided, our emotions, the levels of our stress. All these factors impact upon whether or not you're going to get sick and how sick and to what degree. When we talk about women's health issues, right at the top of the list has to come heart disease for a simple reason. It's the number one killer of women. When you look at the 50 million Americans who suffer from post-stable hypertension, high blood pressure, a lot of those are women. We don't deal enough in our society with nutrition and heart disease and certainly stress and heart disease. Now here's what's unique. We now know, and there's no question about this, that if you have a stressful thought, anxious thought, angry thought, you immediately overstimulate the production of stress hormones. Stress to me is is a hypnotic process. Certainly anxiety is. I work with a lot of anxiety and um, one thing that seems to be across the board is that when people are doing their anxiety pattern, um, they are slipping into a really powerful hypnotic state. And when I say that I mean hypnosis as a state of heightened suggestibility. Hypnosis is a state where you have access to more of the unconscious um, involuntary processes where the fight or flight response comes from. The brain says, uh oh, you know, there's a threat. So it immediately protects you. And the way it does that, it doses you in adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol and all those stress hormones. And it, 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 it speeds up your heart rate and it lifts your blood pressure to send extra blood and oxygen to the arms and to the legs so you can fight or flight. Well, the thing that most people don't realize is that you know the brain reacts the same way to our internal movies. So that someone who has a fear of flying, they can be sitting in their living room thinking about the flight next week, and they will literally start to get into one of those states, right? Because the fear, the narrowing of attention, which is what we do when we get stressed out and we start to narrow and fixate on that thing that we're worrying about, that thing that's causing us anxiety. So we have a narrowing of attention and a little fear tends to excite the, um, the brain, right? the amygdala, all that, you know, and it will flip this aside so that what happens is when we're starting to get scared and fixate, we literally slip into a suggestible state so that the next things that we say to ourselves kind of act like hypnotic commands. And it becomes a feedback loop because that goes into the unconscious mind and the brain starts to release the adrenaline and the noradrenaline and those things that are going to make us uh, feel protected. Those stress hormones like epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, cortisol, adrenaline, those are only meant to help you for a few seconds to flee, right? They're not meant to be with you all day long. The body cannot distinguish between you're being, you know, under a bad day because you heard something you didn't like over the telephone or you're just not feeling good about something and suddenly you're killing yourself. Every negative thought you have, every stressful thought, cascading. There's so many ways that you can manage your cortisol so that it's not managing you. 
I've got many suggestions that are in my book, The Hormone Cure, but here's some of my favorites that really move the lever for women. Number one, there's a supplement called rhodiola, and it's one of the herbs that is most proven to help women with their cortisol levels. Another thing I suggest is that you are getting omega-3s. Now you can get it from fish oil, krill oil, vegetarian sources of omega-3s. That really helps you as well with your cortisol level. Another suggestion is phosphatidylserine. What was found, and it's very interesting because this brings up the point about how hormones are non-linear. They're not simple. They're not the way that you might think. More is not necessarily better. Phosphatidylserine at 400 milligrams is very effective at lowering cortisol levels. But if you go higher, 800 milligrams is not as effective. So those are some of the strategies that I think are very effective. I'll mention one last one, orgasm. Orgasm reduces your cortisol levels because it raises oxytocin, that hormone of love, bonding, and connection that's so important for the female body. Now, if you had no skin and you could look into a transparent body and you could see all these trillions of biochemical processes every second and they were destructive, you could see the cells dying because of cortisol. You could see your brain chemistry changing because of cortisol. When you start playing with the brain, in the brain chemistry, you really get into some deep water because when you start thinking stressful thoughts, normal brain chemistry shifts. And now you've got negative brain chemistry. Whereas if you thought positive thoughts, happy thoughts, constructive thoughts, empowering thoughts, motivating thoughts, then the brain chemistry elevates up because the hormones you're secreting are all constructive hormones, not destructive. That's why when we say, you know, you're killing yourself from stress, you know, that's what we mean. You literally do kill yourself. So dealing with stress is a crucial part of the healing process and one that cannot be avoided or denied anymore. The doctor's looking for obvious, gross problems. But unless he does detailed examination, they'll never know how sick you are. They can't see your arteries clogging up. You could have clogged arteries for 25 and 30 years, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then one day, your arteries like that, your blood pressure is having a hard time getting through there, boom. You're only gonna find the first symptom that you're sick with a heart attack or a stroke. I wanna share with you some protocols that I've created that have helped other people with heart disease. And do them in stages. I understand that not everybody can do everything, and I'm not suggesting you have to do everything, but I am suggesting that if you really take your time and you take one step at a time and you decide, for instance, that with these protocols, you're going to do at least some of this every single week and you're going to move more in every month. You want to have a healthy heart, and I'm going to get into this protocol, you've got to get rid of the animal fats and put in the vegetable fats, olive oil. I'm not even going to restrict you in olive oil, all right? And flaxseed oil. I want you to have this stuff. This is healing. And oil of primrose and walnut oil and, and avocado oil. Plenty of good oils to eat, but because they have essential fatty acids our body can use to help protect our heart. That's right. And the oil of salmon. Did you know that salmon oil helps protect your heart from heart attacks, lowers your blood pressure, it's great for hormone balance? You know one of the best things in the world to help your hormone balance is oil of primrose? Those are the oils we want. Now, there are other things that will help you if you have heart disease. I'm just going to give you a list. And there's good literature out there. There's good reading that will help you in your journey. These are all natural nutrients. One is called coenzyme Q10. It gives extra energy to the heart. It builds up your immune system. It's powerful. Between 100 and 300 milligrams a day, whoa, could we help people with heart conditions. Vitamin E, 400 to 800 units. Vitamin B1, 25 to 50 milligrams. Vitamin C, buffered. So when you're smoking, drinking, eating a processed diet, there's no vitamin C in it. And as a result, your skin begins to sag and free radicals create the wrinkles. You start getting that, that kind of ruddy look. Vitamin C changes all that. Now, L-carnitine. L-carnitine is an essential nutrient that also protects the heart. I would suggest anybody who has heart disease, consider L-carnitine, generally between 500 to 1,500 milligrams. Now, as a runner, as an athlete, I always take L-carnitine before I work out, and coenzyme Q10, and finally, lecithin. Lecithin is essential, too. And don't forget their stress management, being able to do 
oh, let's say, relaxation techniques. You gotta hit the pause button. So there's so many different ways that you can do that. I don't like to tell people, hey, you gotta meditate. It's non-negotiable. I like to give people an a la carte menu of many different strategies. The word yoga itself means union. Um, it means um, yoking together the mind and the body. And um, what we are using are the two tools of movement and breath to bring together our minds and our bodies. I would like to say that that happens as an, on an experiential level when we think about how our minds, when they are cluttered and chattering away with us and full of, of noise and distraction, that um, if we begin to take our breath and slow it down and modify it and breathe smoothly and slowly, that automatically that mind will follow the breath. An agitated mind cannot exist in the presence of a calm, soothing breath. In my own practice, I teach meditation and I see meditation having immediate tangible effects for people where many aspects of their lives are improved, their relationships with other people, their family members, their co-workers, and their own relationship with themselves and their self-esteem. So meditation is something I highly recommend. There's been so much research and so much scientific research that supports what practitioners have known for centuries about what meditation can do. And they're imaging the, our brains on, uh, now. Um, there was a recent study done up at Massachusetts General Hospital about how just eight weeks of mindfulness meditation practice can change the structure of your brain. I teach my clients to just, whenever they're starting to feel stress, take just one minute to drop your mind to your heart and breathe. And just everyone will just start to feel that kind of shift. So that's one way. Another way is to do almost the opposite of that, which is to extend outward. Now expand your peripheral vision to all the space around that screen, and then expand even more. So you get the space all the way. Imagine you can be aware of the space really far out in your peripheral vision, all the way up to the ceiling, below to the floor, expanding peripherally so that you can get a sense, almost imagine, that you can expand even more, almost as if you could be aware of the space behind you. And then bring it back in. The reason why I teach it to people with anxiety is because it stops internal dialogue. Because they say, you know, you have about a 90 second duration of any biochemical emotional wash, right? So you get anger. It really lasts 90 seconds if you let it go. As soon as it starts to ebb, most of us will re-trigger it. How do we do that? Internal dialogue. We'll be like, how dare they? But I should have done this or I, why didn't I do that? You know, we're just so good at keeping stuff going. But with all of these techniques, if you recognize that biochemically you've got about 90 seconds, right? And then if you drop your mind to your heart and breathe, or if you expand peripherally, then you're not going to re-trigger that. And you do that about five or six times, a deep diaphragmatic breathing, that will help relax you because you're increasing the ability to de-stress the brain by enhancing brain hormones. This is all for your heart. Disease manifests in the presence of conflict. Look at where conflict exists and resolve it, prevent it, and then you won't have heart disease.
you'll have a vital heart that will last you 150 years. Like Anne Frank, I believe that people are really good at heart. And I think that the terms at heart is really the center of how we can become more empathic, more compassionate, and live with greater kindness. I think our heart really informs our head and it informs us about how to live with love and goodness in the world. And so when we learn to trust the wisdom of our heart to a greater extent, we can live in a more peaceful and loving manner with the world around us. I'd like to share information with you now on a very serious topic, and that is breast cancer. Breast cancer drives a stake in a lot of women's heart because it's so terrifying. Rarely has a condition been such that women feel helpless when they get it. And so I'm going to give you some tools that you can use to re-empower yourself. First, the idea of early detection as the primary way of determining your chance of surviving it. That's only part of the story. Second, the idea that if you should be told that you have cancer, then by all means get uh, the uh, treatments generally surgery and chemotherapy and radiation, and always get a mammogram at least uh, on an annual basis, depending upon your age, as a way of, of helping you prevent the cancer from early detection. If women began the changes of lifestyle, changes in getting rid of the pesticides in their diet, taking the healthy phytochemicals. Now there's the key. Why is it they're not getting the breast cancer in Japan and in China and in Indonesia as they are here? Because A, they're eating a soy-based diet, a vegetarian diet primarily. They have lots of grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, and lots of sea vegetables. The average American woman has no sea vegetables ever. Kombu, wakame, nori, hajiki, sea vegetables. You can buy them in your local market. We're not eating them because we don't know about them. Exercise. Exercise aerobic is crucial because when you increase the aerobic quality, get your pulse up, right, and to get you really healthy. So by aerobic exercise, cancer does not manifest easily in a high oxygen environment. It's fundamental to all cancers, not just breast cancer. It's fundamental to every cancer to keep our immune system strong, okay? Part of the immune system is what is called the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is the process in our body of um, bringing toxins and all out of the body. Also part of the immune system is the cardiovascular system, which brings good things like oxygen to, throughout our body to all of the cells in our body. Yoga does both of these things, and both of these things as a preventative and as a recovery process. We use a system in massage therapy of stroking our body, guiding the lymph through our body. And this is something that we can do in, in our yoga practice with the ways that we move our arm and we guide the lymph in our body. Um, that's a physical movement way of, of moving lymph. But there's another very critical way that we move lymph in our body, and that is with our breath. So once again, back to the principles of yoga, moving and breathing. Every time we move a, a muscle or a bone in our body, we are moving lymph and blood. And every time we breathe in, we are also moving lymph through our body, right through the center of our body with that deep diaphragmatic breath. Uh, so in, in terms of, of cancer prevention and also recovery, breathing and movement are critical and fundamental to keeping the immune system strong. But when you're sedentary and you're smoking and taking alcohol and eating sugar, things that create an acid base in your body, acid, it's not good. You want alkaline and that's what you get from a vegetarian diet and exercise, all right? Cleanses the body. You get toxins out of the body faster and you burn them out, get them out. And you also want to detox. Now, when I talk about detoxification, I'm not talking about alcohol, I'm talking about cleansing the system. Everyone I work with now, for the first six months, I put them on a cleansing program. First, it's eliminate. You must eliminate all the things that are bad for you, all right? And you know what they are. You know, all the pastries and the 
candies and the sugar and the ice creams and, and the coffee and the bagels and the hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, and you think, my God, Gary, that's all I eat. There's nothing left. Well, that's the problem. That's why you're sick, because that's what you do eat. And throw in occasionally an orange and think you're doing something good. And you don't take an organic apple, you take a regular apple, and they put paraffin wax, which is a cancer-causing agent, on there. So we've got to cleanse the system. Juicing, start with one glass of vegetable juice per day and build up. And it can be celery and cucumber, your favorite green, and even aloe vera, and with vitamin C in it. And that's terrific as a detoxifying. And watermelon juice cleanses that system out. Great for you also. Lemon and lime, terrific. Also helps prevent cancer. So take some watermelon. Put in the whole lemon, meaning the skin and the seed, because it also helps you with your candida, the yeast in the intestine. Let's go to the mind-body connection with cancer. Norman Cousins wrote an interesting book, and in that book he had a disease that was not reversible medically. And he showed that by thinking funny thoughts and watching Marx Brothers films, it changed how he felt, and ultimately he was able to overcome his condition. That's how powerful the mind is. Well, think from a woman's perspective. All of the different thoughts that will give you a sense of completeness, wholeness, an integrated sense of self that you haven't used. Um, think of your attitude. If you have an attitude that you're a victim, you're overwhelmed, you're overworked, you're not honoring your own life. Maybe you went to school, maybe you got a career and, and you did it all right. You did everything you were told to do. You did not disobey anyone. And then one day you wake up and you're still feeling alone and disconnected. Hold on, I work so hard. I've done everything. Why? Why do I still feel empty? And you know what women frequently do when they feel empty? Work more. Get busy. But move more things. They never stop for that moment of unconditional quality of self because if you're all alone and there's no distractions, there's no noise, phones, nothing else except you, then you got to come to grips with you. So what if you just start to say, okay, okay, here's what it comes down to. If I've lived my life up to this point, and if I do not feel fulfilled, then I'm going to change my perception and perspective about who I really am. I'm going to start honoring the real self, not the conditioned self, not the social self, not the, you know, the self that everybody has relied upon. I'm going to honor the real self. Do you think you're beautiful? By what standards? Hmm? Well, if you're the average woman, and let's say you're 35, already, based upon how we treat beauty in this country, you're looking in the mirror and you're somewhat concerned because you're no longer 20. We're told that unless you're thin, almost anorexic, unless you have a perfect body that's flawless, both breasts have to be absolutely equal, both sides of your face equal, lips flush and pure, eyes like a little dove, and long, beautiful body that somehow you're imperfect. What if the woman could be anything they want? You know, they, they could be overweight, they didn't have to take care of their hair or face or makeup or anything, but the guys had to have a perfect body, they had to have an abdominal muscles you could do your laundry on. They had to have no fat, had to have a perfect uh, rear, muscles, flawless face, perfect nose, perfect teeth, perfect lips, articulate, and be sensitive, kind, emotionally available, how many men could honor that? Why do we have to have a double standard? Why can't we simply say that it is really immaterial how beautiful you are? It is the beauty of your spirit, it is the beauty of your nature that counts. When I lived in the Bronx, it was wonderful because I lived in a Latino neighborhood where there were many full-figured women who were hot and they were sexy. And I, myself, am a full-figured woman, and so I really learned a great deal about self-esteem from these women in the Bronx. And I'd watch them walking down the street in their tight clothes, and I'd think, yeah, you got it going on. So I really try to encourage women of any shape or size to understand that they can feel sexy and comfortable as who they are. You got one eyebrow the right size, or whether your texture's here, whether you got a little extra pounds. So you got a couple extra pounds, right? So they're imperfections. Life is imperfect. Nothing is perfect. And we shouldn't strive for an artificial perfection. It is foolish, it's expensive, it's demeaning, and it separates men from appreciating what women really are as human beings. Make proper choices, make choices that honor your body, mind, and spirit. I believe each of us is empowered each and every moment and each and every day to make decisions that will 
be of benefit for ourselves and of benefit for humanity and of benefit for the planet. We can make those choices to consume less. We can make those choices to connect more with one another. What we really want to do is support our neighbors, support our communities, support the integrity of the environmental system that is around us and support our ecosystems. And that really nourishes us and supports our hearts. Cleanse and detoxify, get off the caffeine, drink lots of water, have nutrient-rich uh, diet, and then one day you wake up, and after you've done this, and you, you're eating natural foods, you're breaking food addictions, you're getting rid of the sugar and the caffeine and the wheat and the dairy, and you can use hypnosis if you need to because it shifts, it creates a shift in, in, in how we think about ourselves. It's a positive tool. Hypnosis is a state of heightened suggestibility. Hypnosis is a state where you have access to more of the unconscious, um, involuntary processes where the fight or flight response comes from. So if you think about hypnosis as being a state where um, you have pushed aside, the way that I like to explain it is this. If you imagine there's a barrier here, right? And here we have the unconscious mind, and that's about 95% of who you are, of your functioning, of your everyday uh, non-awareness. And then there's this little percentage that is the conscious mind. So the conscious mind is really limited in what it can take in, what it can hold in consciousness. So if you imagine, right, this barrier, and this is where all habituated patterns are. So anything done with repetition, felt with repetition, said with repetition, will become an unconscious pattern. When you're talking about making a suggestion that counters the program running, be it a pain program or a stress program, anxiety program, any habituated pattern, it becomes hard to change consciously. That's why people have a hard time changing. But in hypnosis, we push this aside and our suggestions can go right in. Yesterday I was counseling a uh, mother who has had an eating disorder for years. She has bulimia. Her daughter has anorexia. Now where does this come from? It came from her mother who was fixated on always being skinny. So she starved herself. And in school, the young, and the daughter's about 14, I said, why do you want to starve yourself? She said, well, because Thin is pretty, thin is beautiful, and fat is not. And if I'm overweight, no one's going to pay attention to me. So when you get fixated on something negative, right, you go into one of those depressive trances, which are really heavy and slow moving. And then you kind of, you know, go deeper and deeper. I mean, that in itself is trance-inducing, right? It's just a negative trance. So there's many ways to look at that and to, to think about hypnosis. Um, but to me, I, I think it's a state that we go in and out of all the time, and so you, you might want to be aware of it and aware of your own um, heightened suggestibility to yourself. There's some great quotes, that whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You know that one? It's so true. When I work with people and I hear their story, if you listen to someone's story, you know the story they tell themselves primarily, their therapists, their family. It's the repetitive story of what I can't do or my pain or this and that. If you listen to their story, you'll know the self-hypnosis they're already utilizing. Breaking the cycle of food addiction is crucial. And you do that by starting to reintroduce food in larger amounts. From a woman's perspective, she has to understand a guy sits down to a meal and he's going to eat until he's full. A woman never eats until she's full. A woman eats based upon what she feels her body can handle without looking overweight. And she counts calories. Men never count calories. You never see a guy count calories. He just sit down. He'll eat the plate. He'll eat the table. He'll eat anything that's moving. Women are very specific. Well, I can't eat that because it's got fat in it. I can't eat that because wrong. Start to eat a good vegetarian diet. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be able to eat more than what you would normally eat. I never count calories, and yet I stay fit, and all the women I counsel stay fit and lose weight if they need to, but they gain weight if they need to because they're eating what the body requires, complex carbohydrate, a good vegetarian diet, and make sure you get zinc in liquid form. Oh, there's so many misconceptions about women. And 
this is one that is right at the top of the list. PMS. Do you know that in the 1800s you could be put into a mental institution for suffering from PMS? Do you know that millions and millions of American women in the 1960s and 70s went to their physician talking about problems of PMS and the doctors do a cursory exam and say there's nothing wrong with you and give them Valium? Over 100 million toxic, unnecessary tranquilizers were given. Take control, change your diet, and watch PMS no longer be an issue in your life. Menopause is said to begin when a woman goes through one complete year without a period. The stage before menopause, called perimenopause, may last as long as 10 years. When it comes to perimenopause, the great news here is that there are so many things you can do to reset your hormones, to get your hormones working for you, not against you. Now there's many hormones that are involved in the symptoms of perimenopause. Progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, all of those hormones can be reset with the way that you eat, move, think, and supplement. You don't necessarily need to jump to taking hormones. You wanna make sure that your estrogen and progesterone are in good balance, that you don't have too much estrogen compared to progesterone or too little estrogen. You want it in the sweet spot where it's not too high and not too low. There's many ways to do that. One important one is to make sure that you're getting enough fiber. And for women, I recommend 35 to 45 grams of fiber a day most women in the U.S. get about 14 grams a day. So this is a very important piece of helping you with your memory and with your estrogen and progesterone levels. We've been led to believe that as you age and when you hit menopause, your ovaries simply dry up. They cease having any use, no longer secreting the hormones that once kept you young and vital. So you can take them out, all right? Wrong. And I want to explain how that works. When you're in perimenopause, the ovaries go through elasterol. The body is making very high levels of estrogen, trying to kickstart the ovaries so they can keep going. There's subtle winding down, all right? It's not all at once. There will be some fluctuations, and sometimes they can be erratic, and that can cause hot flashes. At menopause, your body shifts just enough so you no longer are able to produce eggs, but you're also still producing adequate levels of estrogen to maintain the functions of your body. At menopause, the outer part of the ovaries, which has been more responsible for producing eggs, begins to shrink because eggs are no longer being created. But the inner part, called the inner stroma, actually gets switched on for the first time. It produces hormones that look after your heart, your blood vessels, your skin, your libido, protecting the woman's body and her well-being. when it comes to progesterone, progesterone can make you not sleep well. And we know that in perimenopause and menopause, so we're talking about women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and older, when you don't sleep well, you don't remember well. So that's a really important piece to focus on. And there's ways that you can raise your progesterone, such as by taking vitamin C. 750 milligrams of vitamin C has been shown to raise progesterone levels. Menopause is not a disease. The medical community has created this belief by stressing the need for hormone replacement therapy. In reality, menopause is not a disease, but a natural transition that should be dealt with naturally. Now, the food that is the highest content of estrogen is soy. Soybeans, tofu, tempeh, soy milk, anything made with soy will contain plant estrogens. Oats, cashews, almonds, alfalfa, apples, flaxseed contain smaller amounts of estrogen. A woman emphasizing those foods in the diet can experience significant decreases in her hot flashes. When it comes to hot flashes, it's interesting. Women have been having them for so long and we still don't understand what causes them. We do know that it's part of the story for many women because of the drop in progesterone levels in the first half of perimenopause. So this is for women mostly between about 40, 45, maybe 50. In the second half of perimenopause, when estrogen starts to go down, it doesn't seem that this is as related to hot flashes, but one of the most important drivers for women who are gonna have hot flashes versus not suffer with hot flashes is how much stress a woman has and how much cortisol she has. So women who are really exhausted, who push the pedal to the metal, and believe me, I can relate to this because I'm, I, I've got adrenal fatigue and recovery. When you have that, it tends to make hot flashes much worse. Some of the ways that you can make it better, 
When you keep the temperature in your bedroom, 64 degrees, women sleep so much better, they're far less likely to have hot flashes and night sweats. There's a technique, there was a great randomized trial, which is the best evidence that you can have when it comes to women in health. There was a randomized trial showing that breathing, when you breathe for 20 minutes and you take a five second inhale, you can even do that with me right now, and a five second exhale, when you do that for 20 minutes twice a day, it reduces hot flashes by 50%. That's pretty dramatic. So many of these techniques, I think, are what you should start with first. They're foundational for reversing hot flashes. Sugar, you've heard me say it, can cause hot flashes and other menstrual symptoms that should be avoided completely. Sugar, coffee, alcohol adversely affect the blood sugar and can disturb the emotions. In addition, a number of fruits and vegetables are particularly high in phytochemicals, phyto, plant chemicals, and phytohormones. These include apples, grapefruits, lemons, pears, peaches, and a wide variety of vegetables that are high in fiber and loaded with phytochemicals. I found that a diet with the right amount of proteins, fats, and low glycemic carbohydrates not only helps regulate sex hormone production, but it also helps to balance the hormone response to food, which I think is critical to keeping blood sugar levels stable. And a level blood sugar helps prevent perimenopausal symptoms like depression, mood swings, hot flashes, and that it encourages weight loss without any effort. And vitamin E. This vitamin is known for its ability to rejuvenate the reproductive system and alleviate hot flashes. And finally, progesterone oxygenates the cells. Now, pregnenolone helps the body create female hormones. And DHEA, natural DHEA, found in wild yam extract preparations, rejuvenates the body. And progesterone cream or serum, progesterone is a woman's rejuvenating hormone, which protects against cancer and fibrocystic breast and increases the beneficial effects of thyroid hormone. In addition, it guards against osteoporosis by putting calcium back into the bones. After menopause, progesterone can be taken three or four weeks out of a month. And wild yam creams contain progesterone and can be purchased over the counter. And oral natural progesterone can also be taken. Now, estriol, E-S-T-R-I-O-L, is a natural friendly estrogen that has been shown to inhibit breast tumors in animals. And some gynecologists are beginning, thank goodness, to recommend estriol for menopausal women as being safer and more effective than synthetics. And triple estrogen, this is a formula, it's about 80% estriol, and the remaining 20% is made from estrione and estradiol. And estriol provides protection from breast cancer. Together, estrione and estradiol help protect against osteoporosis, cardiovascular problems, and more. Exercise, regular exercise can reduce the frequency and severity of hot flashes, and this is because it decreases follicle-stimulating hormone. And for best results, it's a good idea to begin exercising before menopause begins. Otherwise, exercise may trigger hot flashes. Exercise also alleviates mood swings and depression by raising naturally serotonin and endorphin levels in the brain. The fascinating connection between menopause and thyroid problems. I like to call it thyropause. My friend Mary Showman gave me that term, and I, I think it really fits here. You've heard of menopause where your periods cease, and then there's thyropause, and that's when your thyroid is not working the way it used to. So your thyroid is really important for your metabolism, how fast or how slow you burn calories. So many women at age 40, 45, 50, 55, notice that they're not burning calories the way that they used to. It just seems like the engine is slower than it used to be. It's harder to lose weight. It's harder to lose the muffin top. And that's where you really need to look at your thyroid. And you wanna really be vigilant about your thyroid function. Don't use the old school reference ranges when it comes to your thyroid labs. It's very important to use the optimal ranges for you. Say your thyroid's not working. Maybe you have depression. 20% of people with depression have a slow thyroid. Or maybe you have hair loss. 50% of women at age 50 have hair loss, and often I find it's related to their thyroid. Or you have fatigue, or you have trouble with weight loss. What you wanna do is test your thyroid. What you measure improves. So this is one of the hormones where I think it's so important to start with a simple blood test. So you can ask your practitioner to test your thyroid. Now, I like to do a panel for the thyroid, not just the old school thyroid stimulating hormone. I like to look at your free T3, 
your free T4, these are other hormones that your thyroid makes. I also like to look at reverse T3 in some women. Now, what do you do to help your thyroid if it's not working well? I like to start first, step one, with filling in nutritional gaps. And here's what I find when it comes to the thyroid. There's some very common nutritional gaps. One of the things I found in my own body in my mid-30s when my thyroid was slow was that I didn't have enough copper. Who knew? So copper is this really important mineral. Most of us are not getting the minerals that we need, and I certainly wasn't. You can get copper from oysters, you can get it from certain nuts and other sources, but clearly I wasn't eating enough of those. So I need to take a high potency multivitamin that has the right balance of copper and zinc. Because if you take too much copper, your zinc might get out of balance. You could just take a multivitamin as a way of filling that gap. Another important gap is selenium. Selenium is another mineral that's really crucial for thyroid function. It's involved in making thyroid hormone. And then my absolute favorite celebrity vitamin is vitamin D. So vitamin D is such a crucial part of thyroid function as well as many other hormones. You know, it, it helps you in so many ways with maintaining your bone mass and preventing osteoporosis. But here it's really involved with keeping your thyroid healthy. Millions of American women believe that they are going to suffer from osteoporosis, a thinning of the bones. And as a result, most of them are going to end up taking some form of estrogen replacement therapy. The five leading nations in the world that consume the most dairy, including the United States and Germany and, and the uh, England, for example, and France, we also had the most osteoporosis. And yet, the five nations that consume almost no dairy have almost no osteoporosis. Well, if we're told we need more calcium and dairy is a good source of calcium and, and to prevent osteoporosis, take dairy, then we shouldn't have any osteoporosis. But we do have it, so it's not dairy that's preventing it. And partly it's because A, dairy is highly allergenic in many people, and B, because it's deficient in magnesium. And it's magnesium that we needed, and boron, and phosphorus, and manganese, simple minerals that we could get from a well-balanced diet or supplementation. Now then you're taking soft drinks, and we are a nation that really consumes a lot of soft drinks. And the soft drinks have phosphoric acid. Well, when you take the soft drink, it has a that phosphoric acid, and you take the hamburger or cheeseburger or hot dog or whatever meat you're having or chicken, the two together, high protein and phosphorus, chelate out calcium. As a result, zinc, calcium, and copper are out of the system. So I'm suggesting that when we give up the soft drinks, give up the caffeine, give up the meat, and instead have good quality vegetables and grains and nuts and seeds and legumes, then we're not going to have that osteoporosis. Another way that yoga works to keep the immune system strong is to keep our bones strong. And um, the, the ways we do that in yoga are, are really also quite simple. It's um, not perhaps movement, but uh, non-movement. So where we use our muscles to not move, to stand strong in one position. One way of doing that is to stand on one leg. And when we do that, we are using muscles to stand upright on one leg. Uh, we need the movement of blood to those muscles to have them hold us there. So we need the breath to keep moving the oxygen into our, our, our cardiovascular system. So it will do that. We also um, are using what is called the um, weight bearing of building bone in our body when we take and stand on one leg. It's well researched and known for a long time that bone building, bone loss occurs as we get older with the loss of estrogen in our body. And so when the bones begin to get fragile and break down, what we want to do is to build them up again. Bone is built in a process of called um, the synopsis between the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Osteoblasts build bone and osteoclasts get rid of old bone. And so when we put weight on our bones, those bone cells are put into a synopsis where they begin to work to build new bone together. And that is one way yoga can be very simply and easily a way to prevent osteoporosis and to 
build bone. You're forcing magnesium and calcium into that bone, mineralizing it. You need that kind of little pressure exercise, resistant exercise. It's not difficult to prevent osteoporosis. After all, the Chinese are doing it, the Japanese are doing it, the Philippines are doing it, the Africans are doing it, the South Americans are doing it, and vegetarians are doing it. Yes, that's right. Vegetarians have far less osteoporosis than the rest of the population. Isn't it time now that you understood that you don't need the hormone replacement therapy in order to prevent osteoporosis? Remember, when it comes to estrogen and progesterone, we've got a shameful past. 57 years of, per of prescribing conjugated equine estrogen and medroxyprogesterone acetate before we had a randomized trial. Now, when it comes to testosterone, the longest randomized trial we have is six months. That's why the FDA did not approve the testosterone patch for women. So you want to be cautious. You don't want to just immediately dive into taking a prescription. Look upstream. It's a much smarter way to work with the intelligence of the body. So we're talking about adjusting your cortisol, reducing your stress, filling in those nutritional gaps, trying some of the herbal therapies that help you feel in balance. I've been led to believe that we're merely mechanistic beings. We're mechanical. We're just some cells put together. And to correct the cells, well, you have to go in and give them some kind of therapy. I say that's only a small, tiny part of what's wrong with us. We are also physical, emotional, spiritual beings. We've got to work on that part too. And working on that part is what this part is about, helping you gain the power to have self-confidence to make the right choices in your life. Because when you're doing something psychologically and you're doing something emotionally and you're having positive talk and you're having positive relationships and you're honoring what really works in your life, then where have you created imbalance? Because it's only with imbalance you create conflict and with conflict disease. At least 50% of every equation is your beliefs. What do you believe in? The power of believing in the right thing and energizing that and committing yourself to it, that is as important as everything else combined. Now put the two together. Put the change in diet, exercise, stress management, put all that in with a positive belief system and boom, you've got healing. Have the courage to ask yourself the question that could open up a whole new door in your life of potential for healing. The first question, what excuses do you use to keep yourself from living your dreams? How often have you said, okay, I'd have a dream, but maybe I don't have the education, or maybe I'm a woman of color, or maybe I'm too old to do something that I would have done earlier in life, but I didn't do it, so now I'm too old. Think of the excuses. You don't know something, so the assumption is you don't know how to do something, you couldn't learn how to do it. I'm saying there should be no excuse for you not doing anything you want to do. If one person can do it, anybody can do it. Why in our society have we made women feel that they have a moral responsibility to men and to their family to make it work when it's not working? We're still inundated with patriarchal views in our society. The more that we can step into our own self-esteem and the more that we can step into our empowerment, the more that we can really find our own personal self-expression and move beyond those roles which are really limiting both in our sexual expression and in our other expression in the world, in our workplace world and in our family life. I'm saying women, you've got to demand what you want in a relationship and say, accept nothing less. Because when you start accepting something less, then you start getting the emotional separation and everything else becomes more important and people forget who you are. So put it in your mind that a relationship is going to be a healthy relationship, a happy relationship, a growing relationship. But life is important in a good quality relationship. Second, what types of emotions and attitude cause others to take notice of you? If you're an individual who has gotten attention by doing all the things that other people could do for themselves, you're a chronic caregiver. Oh, don't do that. I'll do it. Oh, you don't have to clean up. I'll do it. Don't worry, I can make the dinner myself, don't worry. I'll clean up the dish, don't worry about it. I'm saying let's start getting to the idea where we stop doing everything for everyone else and have properly shared responsibilities in our life because at the end of the day, one of the reasons you don't diet properly and eat right, and one of the reasons you're not doing meditation is because you have no time left for you. You're more important in your career and you should never make your career more important in your life. So when we look at things that fail, do not beat up on yourself. Everything in life fails. When you, see a, when you see anything, you're seeing the end stage of a process of mastery. Why then should we 
beat up on ourselves when we do something wrong, say something wrong, or feel something that's not in our best interest. It's, we're merely a work in progress. So forgive yourself for being human. Do you believe that you're enough to be enough in your own life? If you do, you won't kill yourself for your career. Women have been led to believe they're nobody until somebody loves them. All right? Then you spend your whole life trying to prove that you are worth love. You are complete. The real self, the real authentic self that's in you is complete. It's completely spiritual, completely beautiful, completely wonderful. It's the conditioned self that has the defects. You cannot make yourself whole in the conditioned self, but you can in the real self. So get real. Get with what is uniquely you and say, I don't need anyone else telling me I'm a nice person or a loving person. I am that person. I'm happy with me. You as a woman have the right to determine what you want in your life and what you want to exclude, what you want to believe in and what you want no longer to accept. Now, you know what has limited you. You know the falseness of many of the beliefs. You know the conditioning of your mind. You know how it's caused disease and disharmony. So you open the door of innate knowledge. You're curious about all these other systems of belief, and you take a step forward into a new millennia of new enlightenment but you're still holding yourself back out of fear. Will I be respected if I make choices on my own? Will I be accepted if I boycott things or make positive political statements? The next generation of daughters and granddaughters deserve for you to walk forward. When you're not afraid to make one step, then you're gonna make another step and another step and another step. There was a time just 20 years ago when women were forbidden from running in any marathon because doctors, male doctors said, your body can't handle it. Well, today the majority of marathon runners are women because physiologically they're better adapted at running a marathon. I'm saying embrace the best that you are. I began this program asking the men to leave the room. However, I really hoped a lot of men would watch, too. If you're one of them, thank you. Now you'll be part of empowering your partner to enjoy the best life possible with a greater understanding of conditions specific to women and how you can together create the most balanced and fulfilled life possible and embrace the power and beauty of women.